Hello there my RPG lovers and welcome to another video. And here we are in 7th episode of Hidden Gems of Trash. I read the script and I know we get past this. It's just a matter of time. A series of videos where I explore some forgotten RPGs and action adventures and where I try my best to give you a mini review or preview for each and every one of them. If this is your first time watching, I highly suggest watching the previous episodes first, but there is nothing wrong with starting with this one as well. Although you might miss out on some inside memes and jokes. Enough, I'm not here for sex. You're not? But I was told you were coming. Yo, what up guys? Uh, this is not a sponsor, so don't worry. Uh, well, I guess I'm the sponsor. <laughs> I'm just here to tell you that uh, you can check out my uh, store for t-shirts and hoodies, which I made. Uh, recently I guess and I just keep adding new designs. You can find a lot of cool designs in the team of the channel like uh, running memes on the channel and stuff like that and I I plan to add a lot more designs in the future so yeah just a quick shout out to my uh, uh, t-shirt and hoodie store and of course you can always become a Patreon or a YouTube member if you want to support the channel more directly but the most important thing is to watch the video of course. Let me not waste any of your more time. Any of your more time? I can't speak on the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Not very good at this, but yeah, I just want to give a quick shout out to all the additional ways you can support the channel. That will be it. Back to the video. Number 5. Sword Coast Legends. Sword Coast Legends is a CRPG set within the universe of Forgotten Realms, a campaign setting of Dungeons & Dragons. This game came out in 2015 and after only a couple of years, it got delisted. According to delistedgames.com, Dungeons & Dragons publishing contract has ended, requiring the game to be removed. That's really weird man, why would you only buy the license for a couple of years, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Although there is probably a lot more to this story that we don't know but anyway, I heard about this game back in the day and I always thought it, it's a pretty bad RPG for some reason. Maybe because of the mediocre ratings and the poor reception, I don't know, but I never wanted to try it out. Well, after playing it for about 5 or 6 hours so far, I can say without a doubt that I was completely wrong. In fact, I'm struggling to find a reason why people didn't like this game that much. Sword Coast Legends is a CRPG, which plays very similar to games like Pillars of Eternity, Baldur's Gate or Pathfinder. However, this game is not extremely deep like those games I mentioned, but that doesn't make it bad. On the contrary, it makes it more accessible to players who want to get into this genre. D&D rules can be very overwhelming for new players, but that's not the case with this game. The only thing that can be a bit overwhelming is the beginning of the game because you instantly get a lot of party members. All of them have more than a couple of different spells and it won't take long until the game starts to be a bit more challenging. I play the game on normal and it starts off really easy, but the difficulty picks up after about 40 or 50 minutes in. The character customization should be familiar if you play RPGs and D&D games, you get several different races, classes and the customization options are pretty good. The game is still looking pretty decent, especially if you can run it on higher resolutions like 4K and I managed to get a stable 60fps for the most part. There are some segments where the game looks really flat or boring I guess, especially in the open areas, but for the most part, I like how the game looks. It's nothing amazing or anything, but it's more than enough for me to enjoy the game. When it comes to the story, you start the game as a member of the mercenary group called the Burning Dawn. Burning Dawn has a rich history, which is somehow connected to the strange nightmares you and your party members have. The Burning Dawn is hard to escort a caravan from Neverwinter to the city of Luskan, and this is where the game begins. You start clearing the area of bandits and the main story of the game quickly picks up. It doesn't take long for some significant things to happen, which I found quite interesting, mainly because most of the characters are decently written and voice acted. I assume you're with that halfling that came through here. I have never seen such anger. Not since I raised Kipper Harple's old cat from the dead. There are a bunch of dialogue interactions with RPG skill checks and actual gameplay consequences. So yeah, pretty much everything you will want to see in a game like this is there. You have come. Enough, I'm not here for sex. The gameplay mechanics are also fun to play around with and you will have to do some micromanagement in fights, even on the normal difficulty. The party AI is pretty good, so the characters you're not directly controlling at the moment will cast appropriate spells, for the most part. 
but if you like these kinds of games, I'm pretty sure you'll want to make those kinds of decisions yourself. This is a real-time combat RPG with pause menu, which you'll use a lot. It's very easy to tell the characters what to do and controlling them is fairly responsive. They won't always instantly do what you want, but it's not a huge deal. The animations are decent at best, but it's serviceable for this kind of a game. There is a very simple gore effect in combat, which can turn some enemies into chunks of meat upon death, which looks a bit stupid, but I can appreciate that. <laughs> However, compared to how the combat looks in similar, modern CRPGs, this game is pretty basic. And I guess that's one of the reasons why the game got such poor receptions, along with the fact that it's not very deep, like I said before. I mean, not extremely deep for D&D standards. The speed of the combat is okay, but I would like to have an option to speed up or slow down the gameplay like in most modern CRPGs. The only notable problem that I had with the gameplay so far is the poor quest design in some cases. Some of the quests can feel like the game is trying to artificially extend the playtime. For example, before you enter the city of Luskan, you will need to explore the sewer system and do some quests there. The level design is okay, but some of the quests make you run back and forth for seemingly no reason. On the other side, it seems like the quests can be done in multiple ways if you know where to look or what to look for. The dialogue itself is well written and the main story is interesting enough to keep you progressing through the game. And the actual progression system is decent, it pretty much encourages you to invest points into multiple skill trees. So it's not like the game doesn't have any depth, it's just not as deep as some modern CRPGs. My main character was a two-handed warrior, because of course he was. Your party members are very balanced from the very beginning, but you will meet other characters as you play and you can manage your party members in the camp. So it seems like you can definitely have some nice flexibility with the party management. I still didn't finish the game, but I enjoyed it quite a bit so far. If you could actually get this game today, I would definitely recommend it, especially if you like CRPGs with some light D&D rules. But you know, you can actually get the game if you try hard enough. Or should I say... Hard enough, matey. <laughs> Number 4. Blood Knights Blood Knights is an isometric action RPG released in 2013 for PC, Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. This game was developed by Deck 13 and is the first and the last time they tried to make a game of this type. The reception for this game was not that good, especially on Xbox. It has somewhat better score on PC and PlayStation 3 and it's currently mixed on Steam. After completing this game, I would say it deserves at least a little bit higher scores than that, I guess. You must be out of your mind! I went into this game with very low expectations and I thought I'm not going to like it all that much. It took me just a little bit over 4 hours to completely beat it and that's one of the reasons why I did like this game. It definitely doesn't overstay its welcome. Now I do see the fun. It's a pretty linear action RPG with a decent fast paced action combat, local co-op play, some platforming sections, light itemization and progression system. Blood Knights is also a story-driven RPG with a lot of cutscenes and a couple of dialogue choices that don't seem to affect the game that much. This is undoubtedly the worst part of the game and possibly one of the main reasons for such awful review scores. The story is so bad that it's actually good in a way, or entertaining would be a better way to describe it. See the town? Seeing is done with the eyes. Always remember that. You play as a guy called Jeremy, who is trying to protect a powerful artifact from being captured by the vampires. Jeremy was bound to a vampire because reasons, and shortly after this he turns into a vampire himself. The priest and the holy order then try to kill him and his companion, but of course they survive. Then you spend the rest of the game trying to prove yourself to the priest that you're not working for the vampires. But in order to do so, you'll need to retrieve the blood seal that vampires stole. There are a couple of important characters in the story, but it's pretty damn awful, so I didn't even bother with remembering their names. What a shame. He was so lovely when we... Anyway, time for me to go. Down, down. Follow me, Jeremy. If the Lord lets you, the strongest will have me. I completed this game and I still don't know the name of the second protagonist. 
and I'm pretty sure her name is only mentioned once in the entire game, but I might be wrong since I didn't pay that much attention. On the bright side, the technical state of the game is very good. I managed to run it with no issues on the highest settings in 4K and I didn't have any frame drops or bugs. There are some glitches with the NPCs, but that's the problem with the AI. Visually, the game is not very impressive obviously, but it's good enough for an isometric action RPG from 2013. The art style is very generic with little to no visual variety when it comes to places you're going to visit throughout 7 chapters of the game. I mean, it's not horrible, but it feels very uninspiring. Surprisingly, the character models are not that bad at all. I definitely seen a lot worse than this, even in some recently released games that I covered. So what about the gameplay? Well, it's pretty decent if you ask me. You get to switch between two characters if you're playing solo, but you can always have a friend to join you and take the control of the second character. I completed the game in single player mode and I only played a little bit in co-op with my girlfriend. Jeremy is a melee character while Alisa uses ranged weapons and skills. Alisa, that's the name of the girl. <laughs> Strange name. I'll call you Liz. Don't you dare. Anyway, Jeremy has a couple of regular attacks that function as a combo system along with a couple of unique abilities. The Weird Wind is the most powerful ability you can use and abuse pretty much. There is no resource for these abilities except the cooldown, which is one of the things that makes the game play pretty fast. I played on normal and I think the challenge on this difficulty is okay, if not a bit easy when it comes to boss fights. But that's not exactly because of the difficulty, the majority of boss fights just have one single mechanic that you have to worry about. Except the last boss I guess, who has a couple of different phases but he's also pretty easy. I don't believe I even died once in boss fights and I kinda wish I played on the hard difficulty, although I doubt it would be much different. I kinda like how they did healing in this game. There are no potions that you can chug all the time like in many similar action RPGs. Instead, you have to find these corpses or you can feed on enemies, which can be a trick in crowded fights. There is a much bigger chance for you to die in regular fights simply because there are much more things that can kill you. Not just when it comes to actual enemies, there are traps you have to avoid and gravity is also one of your main enemies. I think I died the most from falling off cliffs but that's because the camera can be extremely frustrating in this game. It has a mind of its own and you're going to experience some awful angles on some levels. Although dying is not that punishing because it instantly brings you back to the last checkpoint, which is usually pretty close and the enemies don't respawn. It truly seems like this game never wants to waste your time, you have this main quest that's very linear and pretty much no side activities at all except for collecting the coins here and there. Switching between these two characters is pretty much necessary in some areas because of the light puzzle solving you have to do, but for the most part you can stick with the playstyle you prefer. I think the range combat is much easier because it takes very little effort to kite all enemies on the map and kill them with range abilities. And when you get crowded with a bunch of enemies, you can always switch to Jeremy for a quick spin to win move. Once you get the hang of all of the abilities and switching between these characters, I think the combat flows very well. It does feel a bit floaty, but it's not that bad. It's a decent hack and slash combat, which can be fun for a couple of hours, especially in co-op. But I also enjoyed it in the single player mode quite a bit, so take that as you will. The progression system on the other hand is very boring because you only get to increase the damage of these abilities and the itemization is very simple. Overall, I would recommend trying this game out if you like what you see. Seeing is done with the eyes. Always remember that. Number 3. Hellgate London. Hellgate London is an action RPG originally released in 2007 on PC. Apparently, the developer of Hellgate had a lot of legal issues and the game has been re-released multiple times in the past. The current version of the game is from 2018 and it's only available on Steam. Hellgate London can be described in a couple of ways. It plays very similar to Diablo-like games but from third-person perspective. However, this also depends on the class you select. So, for example, if you choose to play with a marksman, you can switch to the first-person perspective as well. You wouldn't be wrong if you labeled the game as a looter shooter as well. In fact, it might be one of the oldest games that can be described like that. But no matter how you choose to call this game, the idea remains the same. Hack and slash or shoot your way through hordes of enemies from hell, collect and customize your gear and unique character skills. 
Speaking of Diablo, this game was actually developed by a team led by former Blizzard employees who overseen the creation of Diablo series, so there's that. But instead of fighting the demons from hell in medieval fantasy setting, you get to fight him in modern London. It's a pretty interesting idea for the setting of the game, even though the art style is not particularly great. I mean it's okay, but most of the locations use the same generic assets. That's because the game uses a procedurally generated system for these maps, as well as for the quests. Yeah, pretty much everything in this game is procedurally generated. I always had a love-hate relationship with procedurally generated systems. From one side, they can provide some great replay value, which this genre of games pretty much depends on. And as a matter of fact, Hellgate London has an insane replay value, and if you like the core gameplay, you can spend hundreds of hours playing it. And then create a new class and do it all over again. On the other side, the world of these procedurally generated games can feel very artificial and generic. Which is kinda ironic, because one of the goals of the procedurally generated systems is to make every playthrough unique and different, at least according to every marketing pitch for every one of these games ever. Hellgate definitely makes your every playthrough unique when it comes to the gameplay, but the visual variety is pretty poor and uninteresting. I think they could have been way more creative with this setting. You'll get to explore a lot of tunnels, Hellgates obviously, and random streets of London. When I first entered the game, I thought I was playing an MMORPG from 2007. That was not so surprising because one of the main selling points of the game back in the day was the online play. However, the current version only includes the single player mode, which is completely fine by me. You could probably still manage to set up the online play with the original version of the game if you can bother with setting up a third party software and if you have a friend who is willing to put up with your bullshit. But anyway, I think the game is really fun in single player mode as well. Although those were not my initial impressions of the game, it was quite the opposite actually. This game doesn't leave good first impressions, when it comes to the gameplay at least. The intro cutscene was very good, and it's definitely worth watching, but the story doesn't get in the way of the gameplay a lot. There are only a couple of cutscenes in total, which is a shame because they're pretty damn good. Besides that, there is nothing noteworthy to say about the story of the game. The dialogue is really weak, and most characters try to act silly, which doesn't really translate that well with the intro cutscene. I thought I'm going to play a pretty dark game with a more serious setting in the story, because that's exactly what the intro cutscene represents. The reason why I said that the game doesn't leave good first impressions is because the gameplay feels, well, not that good. It takes a while to get used to, but not because the game is very hard or anything, but because the combat is a bit floaty and it lacks the sense of impact. The hitboxes are much larger than what you would expect, which is not bad by default, but it feels really weird in the beginning of the game. It started to make a bit more sense when you start fighting flying enemies, but even so, the hitboxes are huge, which is a bit off-putting. This is far from a reactionary combat, it's more about playing with all the RPG systems you get. I played the most with my Guardian and a bit with Marksman. I also tried all the other classes, but I didn't play them a lot. The best thing about the classes is that all of them seem fairly unique. The monsters you fight are also randomly generated for the most part, as well as bosses and elite enemies. It took a while before I felt a noticeable difficulty spike, but you can always start the game with the elite mode, which does make the game a lot harder right from the start. The difficulty comes from the number of enemies you get to encounter, their type, and your character stats of course. If you're playing on the normal mode, you won't be challenged that much in the first 10 to 15 levels, but this also depends on the RNG of the monsters. I love when I get to encounter elite and very strong enemies, which you can determine by the color of their names, because they have a chance to drop something nice. Speaking of which, the customization felt a bit weird at first, but it's actually very decent. Just like in most Diablo-like RPGs, you can get items for different classes, but unfortunately, I didn't find a way to transfer these items to my other characters. Although I'm pretty sure you can find a mod to fix that. The Guardian can use one-handed swords, shields and some ranged weapons. You can equip multiple weapons and switch them with a press of a button, assign specific abilities to your main and secondary attack and choose which skills you get to level up. I wasn't that impressed with the abilities for the Guardian or even the Marksman to be honest. The build diversity doesn't seem to be a big factor with these classes, but then again you have enough different classes which are unique by default. You can improve your gear in a couple of ways, and you'll need different materials that you get when you kill monsters and explore these maps. Hellgate London has a bunch of different hub areas where you can take quests, sell, buy or improve your gear. 
the game is divided in many different instanced areas and the map you get is not that helpful to be honest. The minimap is way better and I really don't know why we can just zoom in this map instead of looking at this inferior version. Ultimately, I think the gameplay loop of Hellgate London becomes really fun after a couple of hours and I can see myself grinding levels and gear in the future. A lot of people recommended to check this game out and I can see why. Would I recommend buying this game today? Well, if you love isometric Diablo-like RPGs, you should definitely check it out when you get really bored of Diablo 4. Number 2. Summoner, a goddess reborn. Summoner a Goddess Reborn or Summoner 2 is an action RPG from 2002. This was a PlayStation 2 game but it also came out on GameCube. That's why I tried to use the Dolphin emulator but I had a ton of technical issues. I just couldn't get past the ship tutorial section because the game would always freeze. No matter which settings I tried and how long I googled for solution, after about 3 hours I had to give up. The second option was to play the PS2 version with emulator of course and that was a much better experience. However, I still had some technical issues with this version in terms of texture flickering so I apologize for the footage. It didn't bother me that much because the gameplay was pretty smooth. So what about the game itself? In short, I really like this game and I would definitely say it's a hidden gem. Summoner 2 is essentially a party based RPG with real time combat and a pretty decent story. The story takes place 20 years after the first game and the main protagonist of Summoner 2 is called Maya. Maya was pronounced as a goddess upon birth and she has a huge castle that's like a hub area. The game begins on the ship where Maya is attacked by some pirates. She's on a mission to retrieve a book of prophets that's been stolen by a traitor from her court. The pirate island is the beginning area of the game and shortly after you start exploring this place, Maya gains some special transforming powers which sets the main story in motion. After she comes back to the castle, she learns more about the prophecy and she has to restore the tree of Ele, which gave life to the world. That's essentially the main gist of the story. Summoner 2 has a bunch of in-game and cinematic cutscenes which can hit you hard with nostalgia if you played PS2 games back in the day. Most of the dialogue lines are voice acted and the quality of voice acting is pretty decent, especially for 2002 standards. Can't you feel the wind from the sea? <laughs> However, the graphics are noticeably outdated, even for 2002 standards. But the visual variety is very good in the game. Every place you visit has a unique look and vibe to it. Unfortunately, my experience was ruined a bit with all the visual glitches I had, but still, I was able to enjoy this glorious low resolution PS2 graphics. Well, I actually upscaled the image to 4K, but still, not everything scaled properly. The party members and very important characters have unique models, but everyone else have a bunch of clones running around. Like I said before, this is a party based action RPG. You're going to have up to 3 characters in your party at once, but I believe there are around 6 or 7 party members in total that you can choose from. You'll unlock more party members as you progress through the story and some items in the game can kinda spoil this. That's because every weapon have this disclaimer about the party members and you can get some weapons with names of characters that are not yet in your party. Putting that aside, I really like the gameplay in Summoner 2, even though it does have some notable issues. You start the game by controlling Maya and her loyal bodyguard Sangril. Maya plays like a support character while Sangril is an assassin. You get a simple combo attack for all characters and you can hold the button to block. As you level up, you will get to increase some of your stats, which unlocks unique passive and active abilities for your characters. Some of these abilities can be casted with certain button combinations, but you also get a pause button. All of your party members have unique playstyles. Sangreal can go invisible and she has a very strong backstabbing ability. Maya has heals, transforming spells that we mentioned and some nice melee moves as well. Targis is a tank with a bunch of HP and so on. After a couple of hours of gameplay you start unlocking more companions, so you'll be able to combine the party of 3 however you want. Maya is always an essential character though, so you won't be able to change her. The game also has quests where you get to control only one of these characters at once. 
I usually don't like when party-based RPGs do this, simply because the combat feels awkward, because the game is obviously not meant to be played like this. However, I have to say that Summoner 2 does a decent job with its levels. These particular quests are obviously designed to be beaten with only one character, and since the combat itself is pretty decent, I don't have a lot of reasons to complain about this. The controls are okay, but there is definitely a certain amount of jank within this gameplay. Your left thumb stick is used to move your character, but it also turns your camera quite aggressively. Which is not so uncommon, even in modern third-person action RPGs, but the camera is usually only slightly affected by the character movement, you use your right thumb stick to move the camera. Summoner 2 also uses the right thumb stick to move the camera, but it does feel awkward when you only want to move the character. There is a target lock which can kinda help with this, but still, controlling the character is just not extremely precise, which doesn't matter a lot because you don't need some amazing precision in combat. Your positioning is important for some abilities like the backstab or some strong attack, and they can feel a bit awkward because of the controls, but I didn't have a lot of problems with this. The thing is, I really don't like using target locks, but you definitely should in this game. I think the balancing is a bit weird as well because the first couple of hours of the game feels really easy until the fight with Grobulus, and the bosses in general are much harder to deal with compared to many regular fights, which actually makes sense. You'll have to use a lot more abilities, interrupt spells, heal your party and so on. I really like how the stats of different weapons affect the gameplay. The differences in damage you deal against enemies is very noticeable, depending on the weapon type and stats. You'll get to loot a lot of different weapons and switching between them against different enemy types is pretty much necessary if you want to maximize your damage. The first island of the game tries to teach you this as well since you'll encounter enemies that are completely immune to certain damage types. You get this amazing fire sword in the beginning of the game, but it won't be useful against all enemies. I love when RPGs pull this off properly. I still didn't finish the game, but I'm really looking forward to playing more. <laughs> I would definitely recommend trying it out, and I just hope you have more luck than me with the dolphin emulator. Number 1. Spartan Total Warrior Spartan Total Warrior is a hack and slash game released in 2002 for PlayStation 2, Xbox and GameCube. This is hands down one of the best PlayStation games that I ever played and one of the best hack and slash games in general. The gameplay is very addictive and I just couldn't put the controller down once I started playing. The combat mechanics have aged very well, which was kinda surprising because I didn't expect that I guess. I covered a bunch of games from this time period and most of them have at least some issues with the controls or some core gameplay mechanics. Spartan Total Warrior have zero issues and it's a very polished game in general. I played this game with the PS2 emulator and only when I was done with it I remembered that it was also on GameCube. So I tried that version as well and it looks a lot better but it plays the same so I just continued the PS2 version. Although I would recommend playing the game on the GameCube version with Dolphin Emulator even though it does have some popping issues with NPCs. Putting that aside, let's talk about the game itself. Foolish Spartans. That was very foolish. Spartan Total Warrior has a very simple premise. The story is heavily inspired by the Greek mythology. The Romans have conquered almost the entire Greece except the city of Talos. This is where the game begins and you're playing as a nameless Spartan warrior who is defending the city alongside the legendary Spartan king Leonidas. Before the attack begins you hear the voice of Ares, the god of war, and you'll continue hearing his voice in certain segments of the game. The game really doesn't hold back when it comes to the mythical setting, you will meet and fight a lot of creatures from the myths. Mostly from the Greek mythology, but from some other mythologies as well. I am Beowulf, war chief of the Danes, head taker and hundred slayer. Your warriors cannot stand against me. The story is presented through a lot of cutscenes in between objectives and there is a narrator who has a couple of sentences to say before you go to the next chapter. It's a very digestible, easy to follow story that doesn't get in the way of the gameplay that much. All of the characters are fully voice acted. 
The quality of voice acting ranges from very good to very bad for some characters, but this won't matter a lot because the cutscenes are few and far between. Despite that, all of the cutscenes and the story in general were fun to experience for the first time, but I would really like to have a skip button. You will definitely die in this game and it kinda sucks when you can't skip the cutscenes, but like I said, they are pretty short so it's not a huge deal. The GameCube version allows you to skip cutscenes, so I don't know what's up with the PS2 version. Like I said, the gameplay in Total Warrior aged like fine wine. This is a fast-paced action combat with some snappy controls and very good mechanics. You start the game with a sword and shield, but you gradually unlock more weapons as you progress through the game. Even though this is a hack and slash game, the combat is not a mindless button mash. Although you can definitely abuse some of the attacks you have and kill a bunch of enemies at once. However, the game usually offsets this with the sheer amount of enemies you get to fight at once, and the boss fights are well designed. For the majority of the game, you'll see an impressive amount of NPCs on the screen at once. The best part about this is the unscripted nature of these fights and how good the fights feel. Even the AI would put some recent games to shame. One of my main problems with modern games that try to have large scale fights is how scripted everything feels. Don't get me wrong, Spartan Total Warrior has a bunch of scripted segments as well, but the majority of big fights are just a bunch of NPCs thrown together. It feels like a proper large-scale war, on most levels at least. But of course, that wouldn't matter a lot if the action combat was not good. Killing enemies in this game never gets old because the challenge is definitely there and you get a decent arsenal of weapons to use. Each weapon has a couple of attacks and unique powers you get to use once your energy bar is full. Sometimes the enemy AI will just stand there and get killed, but for the most part, you can't just spam the attack button and win. There is a nice and subtle visual cue when enemies are going to attack you, which allows you to quickly block or dodge. Yeah, dodge roll is also a thing in this game, but it doesn't have any iframes, like most action adventures and RPGs nowadays. However, it's still very useful, but mostly in fights versus elite NPCs and bosses. Your special abilities and stronger attacks depend on the weapon you're using. When your energy bar is full, you can execute a very powerful spell. Almost all of them are useful, but I think the one with the Medusa shield that literally turns all enemies on the screen into stone is by far my most favorite of them all. The weapons also have strong attacks that you can use, but you need to fill this bar first with regular attacks. You can choose to focus on single target or AoE damage with the stronger attacks, and they look and feel very good. They allow you to cut down a lot of enemies at once with a single attack. The game doesn't have a lot of gore elements outside of these attacks, which is what also makes them really fun to use. You can cut off up to 4 or 5 heads at once with a quick AoE move, it's amazing. The single target strong attacks are obviously useful versus elite enemies and bosses. I like using dual swords in this game, but it seems like the spear is the most balanced weapon. Sword and shield playstyle is ok, and like I said before, it has an amazing ability. I don't really like the hammer a lot because it's really slow and the special ability is not that great either. This game has a very simple progression system which doesn't seem like it actually affects the gameplay that much but it's there. Spartan Total Warrior has an old school level design which bunch of objectives you'll have to do. There is a checkpoint system after every objective and each of these levels should take you around 15 to 20 minutes to complete, but this will also depend on your playstyle of course. They really try to make these objectives varied and interesting, although some of them can be kinda frustrating. My least favorite objectives were the one where you have to protect some NPCs or run back and forth to defend a specific point, but other than that, I did enjoy the gameplay in general. You're going to kill hundreds of enemies on each and every level, it's amazing really. I would definitely recommend checking this game out, it's a real hidden gem. Just be sure to check it out on GameCube emulator, because it looks a lot better than PS2 version. Tell me, did you play any of these games and do you agree or disagree with my thoughts? Leave a comment down below. Seeing is done with the eyes. Always remember that. As always, I will have GOG links for some of these games, so if you want to buy them, using those links will support my channel. Speaking of which, check out my t-shirts and hoodies, there are some pretty cool designs in the team of the channel. You can also become a Patreon or a YouTube member if you want to support me more directly. Many thanks to all of my current supporters and I'll see you in the next one.